Hello friends and family and welcome to our October 2nd edition of our boring meditation stuff. It is in fact October 3rd, uh, at least in this part of the world, so I am officially late <laughs> with one of these videos. Um, that's okay. It's better that I continue these with the intention of them being for my friends than for the sake of my streak. So maybe maybe it's good to break the streak. Um, I'm going to begin a series of videos, I'll try to keep them relatively short, about a sutta that uh, I've read recently in a Pali class that I'm taking, a Pali study group. The sutta is the Kukura Vataka Sutta. Um, Kukura is the Pali word for dog, and Vataka is um, it's essentially an ascetic. Uh, it's it's literally one who has taken a vow. And so the Kukura Vataka is the uh, and translated into English is the dog duty ascetic, where the duty of this ascetic is to behave like a dog. Um, and in this first video, I wanted to focus on that idea. So I've spoken before about this idea that our society, our modern society, seems to have a real problem with self-importance. And I think that self-importance is, is very natural animal quality. Um, it begins with the desire to keep oneself alive and to procreate these sorts of things. But that sense of self-importance can become um, it can become quite a monstrosity. It can grow <laughs> almost indefinitely. And our modern self sense of self-importance has certainly done this. And I think that it's best if we reflect on our own self-importance rather than looking to others and judging others. But sometimes it's easiest to see from the outside. And I think that there is no easier place to look than those at the top of society. So 2,500 years ago, that would have been the king or other monarch of some society, someone running a city, someone running a kingdom. And today, these are our celebrities and politicians and ultra wealthy. And they provide us a sort of microcosm. So it's easy, <laughs> it's easier to look outside and to judge someone else. And so if we do that, we can say, oh, okay, this, this ultra rich person has bad intentions or poor intentions and maybe this other ultra rich person on the surface even seems to appear to have good intentions but it doesn't take very much investigation to see that that person with seemingly good intentions is mostly interested in satisfying 
his or her own desire for self-significance. Similar with our politicians, that um, whether the politician is loud and publicly visible or whether the politician is relatively quiet, um, but his or her face may appear attributed to the programs and initiatives they claim to be responsible for. The idea that a person should get behind, um, that a person should remain invisible, um, this notion of in, in the West, we would say service, mostly, public service. Here in India, people would say seva. Um, it has perhaps stronger connotations than the words public service, um, but it means the same thing. And this ideal is a very important ideal, this ideal of public service the ideal of seva. And it can come in all shapes and sizes. <laughs> you could, in my hometown, um, in the wintertime, it's, it's kind of a sweet and neighborly thing to do to shovel your neighbor's driveway or sidewalk. Um, it's the it's the opposite <laughs> of cleaning your own space and causing trouble for your neighbor so the opposite would be to shovel your own sidewalk and dump all the snow on your neighbor's portion of the sidewalk making the work for him or her twice as much and if you do that and don't mention it and it doesn't you have no intention even of being recognized for it you're doing it out of the love of serving someone else um, that same sort of behavior can infuse everything in our lives there's always someone else in our lives it doesn't need to be an entire country it doesn't need to be an entire government it doesn't need to be an entire corporation it can be our family members it can be our acquaintances it can be a random person you will never see again uh, whom we serve invisibly or otherwise and the kukura vataka, the one who has taken this dog duty vow, he in the sutta declares what this vow is. He comes to speak to the Buddha and he moves on all fours when he sits down to speak to the Buddha, he curls up beside the Buddha in the shape of a, a, a lying dog and he declares that he only eats food which has been thrown on the ground. This is, uh, this is a sort of invisibility. Um, this is also a sort of self-importance. The desire, the reason that this man is doing this, and this is a grown man, this isn't a, a five-year-old pretends to be a dog, okay? <laughs> There's some space for imagination. Um, but this is a grown man, and the vow is that he will do this for his life with the belief that there is another life coming 
and that his next life will be better. And in this way, this is self-serving. He is trying to better the next life. He's trying to get into heaven. He's trying to become a god. And the Buddha explains to him that, yeah, I mean, this is within the, the framework of mythology, which subscribes to the idea of reincarnation. Um, but the Buddha explains to him that his next life is at best that of a dog. If you spend every waking moment emulating a dog in this life, that is, that's the upper bound of where you will end up in the next life. And that this mistaken idea of self-service, of attempting to grow between lives by debasing oneself in such a way will actually send him to hell. So if he behaves like a dog and believes he will be a dog in the next life, he will become a dog. If he behaves like a dog and believes he will become a god, he'll become a demon and be sent to hell. Um, I think I, I don't, I don't criticize the mythology. I don't subscribe to the mythology, but I do think that it's fascinating. Um, and I think that the way we can examine this idea from a modern perspective is to think about who this man may have been if he were a real person. These practices did exist in India over 2,000 years ago. I've spoken to quite a few people. They don't exist anymore, generally. Um, but what sort of person, what sort of belief structure, what sort of devotion do you have to have to your ideas, your beliefs, and even to your own abilities to take such a vow that I will eat food only directly off the ground for the rest of my life and I will never walk on two legs again for the rest of my life. That sort of dedication um, seems rare today and um, even for clearly valuable things. And this is clearly valueless to behave like a dog. Um, but this person has this, this resolution, this resolve, this tenacity, where he's been behaving like a dog for decades and he intends to continue for more decades. And so I think that uh, this is an interesting idea to reflect on, not to meditate on, don't meditate on ideas, um, in my opinion. <laughs> Try not to meditate on ideas, but think about this idea of the kind of dedication which has existed in the human species that has existed within the scope of recorded humanity. Um, and there are other more modern examples, right? Uh, we know about how human beings forget the forgetting curve, as it's called, only because of the dedication of one incredibly crazy man and his experiments on himself to teach himself nonsense languages and to see how quickly he forgot them. <laughs> we have an incredible amount, uh, a huge wealth of knowledge due to his uh, completely self-destructive dedication. 
Um, and we have people who are, are dedicated, who've taken vows, um, which are not self-destructive, inherently valuable, and, um, and seem so even on the surface. Um, but it seems that perhaps 2,000 years ago, uh, they were more common and perhaps a bit more strange. I will leave this topic of, of vows um, versus self-importance for today. Uh, and tomorrow, we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the idea of the extremes. What are the extremes? Um, and where does this sort of vow, where does it sit? I hope everyone is taking very good care of themselves and I hope everyone is taking good care of everyone around them. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Goodbye.